Hey everybody, what's going on? I hope you've had a terrific week and I'm glad you're tuning in today. We launched a series last week called Rooted, where we started talking about the roots of our spiritual lives, where we want them to go deep and wide in order to anchor ourselves in the timeless truth and power of God. And last week we started this whole thing off by talking about the Bible. There's nothing more foundational to who you are as a Christian, you know, what you believe, how you live, and how you regard the Bible, how you approach the Bible, how you understand the Bible. Now I've got good news and bad news about the Bible. Which would you like me to give you first? Okay, the bad news first. Studies show that less than 15% of people who claim to be Christians actually read the Bible, like open it up and engage with it at least once a week, less than 15%. And these are people that are in the church. We're not talking about the culture at large. Americans increasingly live in a Bible-free public space. So like confusion or ignorance of the Bible's content, it should just be assumed in the greater culture out there. But the larger problem is the lack of biblical engagement among those who claim to be Christians. Less than 15% engage with the Bible at least one time each week. And we're certainly not exempt from this here. So CCC, what this means is that less than two out of every 10 people in our church open up the Bible and read it at all. Again, just one time each week. We're not talking about being a devoted student of the Bible, just one time during the week. And as a result, we're becoming not only a nation filled with biblical illiteracy, but the church is increasingly biblically illiterate. Now, there are a lot of reasons people are tending to steer clear of the Bible. I mean, a lot of reasons, but I'll give us two. One is people don't read much anymore at all, anything. And number two, the Bible can just be a tough, tough book to understand, which brings us to the good news. The good news is you can do something about all this. In fact, we want to do something about it today. If you tuned in, you know, last week, I gave an assignment to read a chapter from the Bible, from the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke, Luke 24. And what we see in Luke 24 is what the Bible is all about. Luke 24 gives us some help in understanding the Bible and what the Bible is all about. So let's check it out, beginning in verse 13. And here's what's happening at this point in time. You know, this is taking place after Jesus was crucified. It's after he went to the cross. It's after he died on the cross, after he was buried and he rose again. In fact, Luke 24 talks about some of the events that took place on Resurrection Sunday. And two folks, they're confused about it all. And here's what happens. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened here these last days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what's more, it's the third day since all this took place. And in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, Jesus said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, 
Jesus continued on as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it and began to give it to them. Their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and he opened the scriptures to us? You know, last week we talked about the very beginning of the Gospel of Luke, the first chapter of Luke, the first four verses, and the fact that the Bible is true. You can trust it. The Bible is the truth. If you didn't get a chance to check it out, you should check it out if you missed it. And here near the end of Luke, Luke 24, we see that the Bible, it's not just the truth, but it's the truth about a man. See, there's no use, and it could actually be pretty destructive to believe in the Bible in general and not understand its message. Like there's no use in believing the Bible is filled with truth unless we understand what it actually is saying. And that's Jesus's main point here in chapter 24. Luke talks about an incident that happened on the road to Emmaus several days after Jesus died. There were these two Christian disciples walking along and they were very unhappy and they were very confused and they were talking and a stranger shows up, which we know it's Jesus, but they don't know at the time. And he says, what are you talking about? Why are you so sad? Why are you so down in the dumps? And they say, how could you not know what's been happening around here the last few days? Like Jesus of Nazareth, he was a prophet and he wasn't just any prophet, but one who we thought was, was going to be the one. He was going to redeem Israel, but they killed him. They put him to death. They crucified him. And now some of the women are saying that he's alive. And so we're just really confused and, and we don't know what to think. And Jesus says, starting in verse 25, he says, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Like Jesus doesn't sugarcoat it there. He doesn't beat around the bush with these folks. All that the prophets have spoken, like that's the Bible. Jesus is saying, listen, you believe the Bible, you read the Bible, but you can't see the forest for the trees. You believe the Bible and that's fine, but what good is it if you don't see what the Bible is saying? And he says, did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And, and what he's saying here and what he goes on to say and, and what the New Testament goes on to say is that the Messiah, the, the Savior, the Bible foretold, he has come and he has redeemed. But he didn't just come to redeem the Jews, you know, the Israelites only, but he came to redeem the whole world. He didn't come just to liberate some people from social and economic oppression, like, you know, from the Romans or something, but to liberate us all from sin and death. And therefore, he didn't come in strength at the head of an army to go to a throne. He came in weakness and he went to a cross. You know, he died on a cross. He took our punishment for our sins so that God's forgiveness and God's love and God's pardon can come into your life. And then... There's glory. Then he can rise to glory because he completed his work and he redeemed us from our sin. And then there's glory for you too at the resurrection and a new heaven and a new earth to boot. And so Jesus says all that. And then he goes on and he says the most astounding thing of all in verse 20, 27, which if there was ever a moment in time that I could go back somehow and like, I don't know, be a fly on the wall or experience in some way, you know, if I had a DeLorean with a flux capacitor or a hot tub time machine or maybe a time space GPS from Stark Industries or just something to take a quantum leap in some way, this is the moment right here that I would love to experience. Verse 27. And here's what it says. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Do you see what Jesus is doing here? Like it doesn't say starting with Moses and the prophets, meaning starting in Genesis, you know, the first book of the Bible. He goes through the whole Bible. And instead of saying he went through and showed them what some of the scriptures said about him, like, you know, oh, I'm the Messiah. And so there's these uh, messianic psalms here and there. And 
you know, there's Isaiah 53 that talks about the Messiah and Psalm 22 that talks about the Messiah. So let me just show you how some of the Bible talks about, about the Messiah. No, he says, all of it talks about me. Everything in the Bible is about me. Every law is about me. Every maxim is about me. Every axiom, every ethical thing is about me. Every story is about me. I mean, think for a minute. You want to be rooted deep in our faith? Well, this is what we got to get. It's not just useless to believe the Bible is true and miss the fact that it's about Jesus and what he's done for your salvation. It's not just useless. It's destructive. I mean, it's certainly frustrating. It might even be devastating. So, for example, I'd say a great majority of folks have heard of the Sermon on the Mount. Do you believe the Sermon on the Mount is true? Do you believe that it's good? You know, it talks about loving your neighbor and, you know, life at the highest and all that. I mean, forever people have said, you know, the whole Christianity anything. I don't know if I believe all the doctrine, you know, Jesus being God and coming back from the dead and all that, but boy, the Sermon on the Mount, man, that tells you how human beings really ought to live with each other. You know, Sermon on the Mount, that's wonderful. You know, some years ago, Virginia Stem Owens, an English professor in a literature course, decided to ask all her students to read the Sermon on the Mount carefully. Now, most of them had heard of it and they thought, you know, like people typically think, Oh, the Sermon on the Mount, it's wonderful. It's about love and loving your enemies and all that stuff. It, you know, it's great stuff. So she assigned them the task of reading it, like really, really reading it, and then writing a response paper to it. And when they read it, she said most of her students were absolutely disgusted and terrified by it. So like one of the students wrote this, I did not like the Sermon on the Mount. It made me feel like I had to be perfect. Or another one said, the things the sermon asks, they're completely absurd. Sermon doesn't just require that you give lots of your money away, but you got to do it with joyful, cheerful, generous passion. The Sermon on the Mount uh, doesn't just forbid killing, but forbids disdain, superiority, or even treating someone with coldness or indifference. Sermon on the Mount doesn't just forbid paying someone back who is persecuting you, like it doesn't just forbid vengeance, but it also insists that your heart has to be filled with love and hope and prayer for the person who is persecuting you. See, here's why these students were terrified. Because on the one hand, we want to live around people like that, that behave and act like that. We want people to be that way. We, we want people to be that loving and forgiving and that generous to us. We want that. And so because we want to live with people like that, we can't get away from the truth that we ought to be living like that. And unfortunately, we can't. We can't get there. And therefore, if you just read the Bible as a bunch of truth things, true statements, true proverbs, true stories, like live like this, be like this person, true laws, if you just see it as a set of truths and you aren't you know, terrified like those students were terrified, well, are you really reading it? Because here's the point, when Jesus says, it's all about me, everything's about me, all those laws are about me, you say, well, how so? Well, he says, I lived the Sermon on the Mount. I'm the only one who's ever lived it. I fulfilled the Sermon on the Mount. I lived life at its highest, human life like it ought to be, be lived. I did it, and I'm the only one who ever did it. I did it, Jesus says, and because I did it, because I earned God's blessing, but then I went to a cross and I took God's curse. And that means when you believe in me, and this is the gospel here, this is what Jesus is saying. When you believe in me, when you rest in me and trust in me as your Lord and Savior, then all that you deserve comes on me and all that I deserve, it's accredited to you. And now God accepts you and loves you and delights in you as if you did everything I've done. And therefore you're saved by sheer grace, and not by trying to obey everything in the Bible. Like, should you try to obey everything in the Bible? Yes. But primarily, firstly, you ought to see that it all points to him. And not only are all the laws about him, but all the stories. See, we can read the stories as sort of um, piecemeal of a lot of true things. So in Genesis, you know, the very first book of the Bible, there's Joseph. He's 
He's sold into slavery and thrown into prison, but he rises up and he redeems and he saves the people who betrayed him. A little later on in the Bible, there's David and he's, he's too young and he's too small, but he has the courage and he ends up taking down the giant and he saves his people. And in Exodus, there's Moses and he's scared, you know, knees are knocking, and, but he stands in the gap between God and humanity and he leads the people to freedom. And there's Jonah and he lets himself be thrown to the storm and the water to save the sailors. And, and so you can read all of that as a bunch of truth-infused stories, meaning you ought to be that faithful and you ought to be that sacrificing and you ought to be that courageous and you ought to be like that. And what will happen is it'll just crush you. You'll never get there. You know, recently uh, I went golfing with Mike Barlow. Many of you may know Mike Barlow. He serves on our elder team here at CCC. And Mike, he's a well driller. That's his business. He has his own well drilling business. And Mike's also a pretty good golfer. At least he used to be. I don't know what's happened to his short game recently, you know. But anyway, on this day, it was just the two of us, Mike and I, but we got paired up with another guy in our group. And right when we met this guy, like before we even got to the very first tee box, this guy asked a question that I really try to steer clear of for as long as possible when first meeting someone. He asked the question, what do you do? Like for work, what do you do? So this guy asked that question, what do you do? And, and he looks at Mike first and Mike says, hey, I'm a well driller, well driller. I have a well drilling business. And the guy says the standard stuff in response to Mike, you know, asking Mike more about it, like, you know, where's your business and how long have you been at that? And how did you get into that? You know, standard fair stuff. But man, I'm thinking all along the way, you know, if I say I'm a preacher, I'm a pastor, I'm a minister at a church, oh my goodness, what happens is people get all weirded out by that. I've seen it over and over again. Like I say I'm a minister and they start apologizing for whatever their language was up until that point or is about to be from that point on. Or they get all silly and they say things like, hey, you're not going to preach me a sermon on the first part three we come to, are you? And it's like, Come on, man. You know, you don't ask Mike if he's going to drill for water in the first fairway we come to. Why are you busting my chops? You know, or here's what happens. They tell me all the excuses why they miss church or don't go to church, you know, or they just avoid me. Like I, I've got the plague or the cooties or, you know, like I'm planning to baptize them at the first palm we come across. There's always a moment where I think about saying something else like, you know, when they say, what do you do? And I, I say like, well, you know. I'm a body double for Mark Wahlberg or, you know, I'm a UFC cage fighter or I'm Chuck Norris's sensei, you know. Uh, I think I could say something like I'm a drug dealer and get a more normal reaction to it. Like, oh, wow, you know, how did you get into that? You know, have you ever been in jail? You know, that kind of stuff. I could say just about anything. Well, this guy asks and I tell the truth, you know, I'm a minister, I'm a preacher and immediately the guy says, I mean, he doesn't ask a question, just launches into, well, I believe that if you're a good person and you do more good than bad and you keep at it, then we'll be all right. That's all the world needs. We just all need to do a lot of good. And in that brief interaction, he articulates what so many people think and so many people hold to. The, you know, I just got to be a good person bit. And it's crushing us and it misses the point. Seriously, like, when does it end? How do you know you're being good enough? Where's the cut line? When is enough enough? And what happens when you're not doing good or you let yourself down or you let, you know, those around you down? And what happens in the quiet crevices of your life when you're alone with yourself and you think, you know, if people really knew my thoughts and my intentions and the darkness in my life that pulls at me, then it would be so devastating and I'd be so embarrassed because no one can be good enough. We can't even live up to our own standards, much less God's standards. No one can be good enough. But that's what so many people hold to and so many people think what faith is all about. I just gotta be good enough and we can't. And thank God that that's not what the story is about. 
the story we find ourselves in, it's about Jesus. See, we make it all about us. But it's not about us. It's about him. See, you can read the Bible as a bunch of moral idioms telling you to be that faithful like Joseph and that sacrificing like Jonah and that courageous like David and that willing like Moses. And it will crush you and you'll miss the main point. You need a savior and Jesus is that savior. And the Bible tells the story. The Bible tells the history of that savior. It's not all about you. See, there are only two things that can happen. If you see the Bible as a bunch of true things and not about Jesus and not about what he did for you and the saving grace extended to you, if you see it that way, you will either think you are living up to your standard and you'll become a Pharisee and you'll become all puffed up and you know have a superiority complex, or you will not find yourself living up. You'll read it and you'll realize, man, I'm not living as I should, and you'll be crushed and you'll have an inferiority complex. And eventually, you'll probably run away from the Bible and run away from the church and run away from faith because you never came to see what the heart of the Bible is all about. But see, Jesus says, I'm the true Joseph who was sold, who was persecuted, but I rose up and saved the ones who betrayed me. I'm the true David who didn't just save you at the risk of losing my life, but at the cost of losing my life. I'm the true Moses who stands in the gap as the mediator between God and humanity. And I'm the true Jonah because I was thrown into a sea of divine wrath on sin so that you could be saved. Do you see? If we see that the Bible is not just true, but it's about Him, then you know what that'll do? It'll affect not just your mind, but your heart, which we see here in Luke 24. It's this wonderful end to the story in Luke 24. I mean, think about this. Jesus is giving these two disciples an incredible theological seminar. And oh, I would have loved to have been there. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, on par with God, you know, the Messiah, the High King of Heaven, explaining the Bible to two disciples. And guess what? They're not getting it. (laughs) They don't get it. Like they're not picking up what he's putting down. You know, it's kind of up here in their head. It's a, it's a theological seminar. You know, they're trying and they're trying and they're trying, but they're just not getting it. And finally, they invite him in and he breaks bread with them. And when he breaks bread with them, two things happen. First of all, their eyes were open. And that means that they do see, they see that it's Jesus. And they they do make all the connections that he's talked about. And just imagine all the bells and whistles on their theological dashboards going off from what he's been telling them. You know, they're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. We never really understood what the Bible is all about. And he just showed us. And now we see, and this is Jesus and he's the Messiah. I mean, what just happened? He breaks bread and they see who he is and they recognize him. And so mentally it all comes together. But then after he disappears, they say, you know, in hindsight, our hearts knew him before our heads did. Like even when we were on the road and even when we weren't understanding anything he was saying, our hearts were just on fire. Our hearts, or we might say the longings of our hearts, our hearts, they They knew they were in the presence of their fulfillment, even when our heads didn't realize it. And here's what that tells us. Arguments and explanations about the Bible are necessary, but they're not sufficient. Like you need to be convinced, like your mind needs to be convinced that the Bible is true and that you can trust it. You need explanations and arguments to understand that the Bible is true. And that's what last week, that's what it was largely about. And again, if you missed it, go back and check it out. You know, that's necessary, but it's not sufficient because ultimately the goal of the Bible, the goal of the gospel, the message of the Bible is not just to get you to believe the right things, but it's to get you to welcome Jesus Christ into your life as a living presence that restructures the very fundamentals of your heart. You see, normal religion It says, try real hard and do all the good things the Bible talks about. And then maybe God will bless you and maybe he'll hear your prayers and maybe God will help you or like you or accept you. That doesn't change your heart. It just, I don't know, weighs you down. It crushes you with the weight of it all. 
and makes you feel either really proud or really inferior. But either way, it makes you self-absorbed, extremely self-absorbed, extremely concerned about yourself and looking at yourself and saying, hey, I'm living up to it or I'm not living up to it. But the gospel where you're saved by sheer grace at infinite cost to him, to Jesus, you're, you're saved freely, it has nothing to do with who you are or what you've done. Freely, you are saved. You do nothing to earn or deserve it. It's a free gift. And yet it came at infinite cost to him. Well, now that can completely change your very identity because you quit looking at yourself. You don't have to look at yourself anymore. You don't have to constantly be saying, how am I doing? And comparing yourself to other people. It gets you out of yourself. And yet at the same time, it gives you a new desire, a burning desire to live as you ought. See, it's not the old self-absorbed, I got to live a better life. I got to live up to it. No, no, no. You say, I want to be like the one who did all this for me. I want to honor the one who did this for me. It can change the very structure of your heart. So how do you get there? Well, you got to get to a place where you see the Bible is all about Jesus. It's all about him. And you get to know him through it. You pursue him through the Bible. You relate to him through the Bible. You see? This perspective can unlock your potential to connect with God with a rightly oriented perspective of the Bible. This can change your entire life. You know, if you're really frustrated in your faith, well, I'd ask you, is your understanding of what the Bible is all about oriented like this? Do you see that it's all about Jesus, everything? And because we have a tough time getting our arms around the Bible, because it's so intimidating of a book, because it's so dense and demanding. We're offering something around here at CCC beginning on the first Tuesday of October. It's gonna run for seven weeks. And it's called The Bible Made Possible. And we're talking about all this throughout those seven weeks. It's to give us handles on, on how to engage with the Bible in this way and to actually do it together. That could be the most important thing you do all year, The Bible Made Possible. And it's free, but you do have to register for it. And you can do that now. You can do it online. You can do it right now. Do you want your heart to burn within you? Do you want the deepest longings of your heart to find the rest in a personal encounter with God? Well, you got to see it's all about Him. The Bible is the truth, and it's all about Jesus.